Is this the best Lamborghini ever? Welcome to Petro Lounge. Presenting the Lamborghini Huracan STO. As you know, Lamborghini usually names its cars after famous bulls, and this is no exception. The Huracan is named after a bull that was very courageous in bullfighting in 1879, but it also has a much more interesting origin backstory. And part of that is a lot of people ask, you know, how do I pronounce Huracan? And it is a Spanish word. It is pronounced as Huracan because you drop the H. The H is always silent in Spanish. Um, you try to roll your R's, which I'm terrible at. So technically it would be something like Huracan. Um, and that is actually the uh, Spanish word for hurricane. Now, you think about that, a hurricane is a new world event. So it's not something that originated in Spain. It actually originated in the Americas. And it is a Mayan word, and it is the Mayan word for hurricane, but it is also their god of thunder, wind, fire, and storms. And so Huracan was the god of hurricanes. And so here it is on the car that is kind of the brief history of the Huracan name. And now we're just going to take a look at the whole car. This is, you know, the newest Huracan that Lamborghini has produced. And it is the hottest, you know, track ready, nastiest Lamborghini that you can currently buy. Uh, just an amazing car. And what they've done with it is really just incredible. When you start going through this car, start looking at it. It's 75% carbon fiber. It actually weighs in under 3,000 pounds, which for me, sometimes I, I think about that number and it sounds like it weighs a lot, but in today's world for a modern car, especially a modern supercar to weigh in under 3,000 pounds, phenomenal. I mean, the Mazda Miata today clocks in at about 2,400 pounds. So you're talking about a car that is not even 600 pounds heavier than a Mazda Miata, and it's got all of this performance built in. This is the most track-focused Lamborghini Huracan that has been built so far. It is very similar to the Performante, but just kind of kicked up a notch from there. It starts really kind of everywhere. Like I said, this is a 75% carbon fiber body. When you look at this, pretty much everything you're looking at is carbon fiber. And then you get into this weird, clamshell over the the rear engine and it's very unusual it's very specific to this uh, sto and unlike the other versions it doesn't really open the same way it's not a traditional lid you really need two people here and it starts with these locks right here on the car and the car comes with a special key and it looks like this little 3d printed piece of plastic it lives inside the car and you have to put it in here and unlock and you have to do this on both sides and there's a little indicator that tells you it's unlocked and then you press the button here and that begins to pop up one side of the car then you have to go and do the other side and then you get two people and you can just lift this whole thing off which we are about to do so after you have press the button on both sides, you start to lift up, and this is a multi-process operation. There's a catch under here that's hidden. You have to pull that, and that allows you to lift up quite a bit, but you'll find that you contact the other side just a little bit. And what you have to do is actually pull this forward now, and this slides off, and you can lift it off over the back and reveal your engine. So. This panel is actually really light. It's awkward, it's big, but you can hold it in your hands. It's all carbon fiber. Really feels like it weighs about five or six pounds. It's really not hard to carry around or move somewhere. It's just kind of, where are you gonna put it? Now that we have the engine bay opened up, the first thing that you really notice back here, if you're familiar with Lamborghinis, is this is really stripped down. It's kind of bare. It's obvious that in the interest of weight savings, they didn't really try to pretty it up or beautify it in any way. Um, if you open up the, the engine bay on any of the other Huracans, you will find that there's a lot of trim panels and just little things to clean all this up. And yeah, there's just a lot of empty space in here. 
This is the same 5.2 liter engine that comes in all the Lamborghini Huracans. It, uh, it is making about 630 horsepower in this configuration. It is the same exact engine that you would find in the Lamborghini Performante. It is lifted right out of that car and right into this one. There's a few changes software wise, but mechanically identical. And it is identical to this, the engine in the Evo, which is kind of interesting that they have decided to go this route of all of your Lamborghini Huracans now have the same exact engine in them. The Evo is your base model. You have the Technica that is coming out that's going to be kind of the midway point between this and the Evo. And then you have this car, but they're all the same engine. They make the same amount of horsepower and all the cars have roughly the same performance specifications when you start saying zero to 60, zero to 100, they're all the same. So you know, what are you getting for your money with this car? And really what it is, is it's kind of like, if you're familiar with Porsches, you get kind of like the base 911, or you can get the GT3, or you can get the GT3 RS. And that's kind of what they've done here is, this is just a much more refined precision instrument. It is designed for track work. It is track focused. And the more you're in the car, you realize it's not really meant to be driven on the street. You can drive it on the street, but really where it comes alive, where it's the most fun and engaging is on the track. And if you want a track Lamborghini, this is the one you need to buy. Before we move on to other parts of the car, something I did want to mention, something I forgot about as I was looking at this engine bay and it's, it's so overwhelming, it's easy to forget things. Something I've always found interesting about the modern Lamborghinis is the engine is always offset just a little bit to the driver's side. When you look at it down the middle, you can tell that it is not in the center of the car. Now, the Audi R8s are all the same as well. They are actually mounted closer to the driver's side of the car. But in that car, they've actually changed the trim panels and everything to trick you into the optical illusion of believing that the engine's in the center of the car. If you look at it, it's really difficult to tell. Somebody kind of has to point out, but when you look at this, you'll see the cross brace, which is centered on the car, doesn't fit with the engine. And you look at that, and the first time I saw it, I was like, wait, what did they do? Did they set the cross brace off center or is the engine off center? And I really thought it had to be the cross brace that that was, you know, for some reason they wanted it asymmetrical. And the more I looked at it, I was like, no, that's not the case. It's perfectly symmetrical. The engine is actually offset for the transmission. The transmission lives on the side of the engine here. And that is part of the all wheel drive drivetrain. Even though it's not in this car, this car is rear wheel drive only. It still necessitates the engine being just a little bit on the driver's side. And it's something most people don't notice, but it is here. The STO is an evolution of the Huracan Performante. So the performance tends to be fairly similar, mainly because the engine is the same. And it is shared now, as I said, among all of the Huracan platforms. And the performance is pretty much what it is in the Performante, which is zero to 60 in about 2.9 seconds. 124 miles an hour comes up in about nine seconds. Top speed is gonna be about 202 miles per hour. Now, how does that compare to the original Huracan? And that car was still pretty fast at 3.4 seconds, zero to 60. And then you had about 11 seconds for the 124 mile an hour run. And your top speed was roughly 199. Now, I do find it pretty remarkable that this car still manages to hit the same lap times as the Evo and the Performante, mainly because this car has a lot more aggressive aero, it has a lot more downforce, and the Performante had a active downforce system that allowed the downforce to decrease as the car went faster, where you're not going to need the downforce as much. This has a static fixed rear wing. You can change it, but you can't change it in the middle of your driving. So the aerodynamics on this car really kind of start up here at the front, which is way more aggressive than anything Lamborghini has done. And as I said, they've, they've ditched all of the active aero that they had on the Performante and went with just this pure kind of track car. And this whole bonnet here, this whole front clip of the car, it's just a huge clamshell. There's no longer a trunk to this car. 
we'll, we'll open it up in a minute and I'll show you. They claim that you're supposed to be able to put a helmet in this car, but I mean, maybe a helmet for kids. I don't really see it. But this, again, you're, you're going to encounter these strange clips up here where you need the special key to open this front, tr well, I won't even call it a front trunk, this front clamshell. And you have to press the button again to kind of pop the clamshell. You've got a lot of extractors here trying to get heat out from underneath the, the car, mainly from the radiators, also the brakes. You've got these huge aero ducts. Again, they didn't really think about, well, you know, you're gonna need a trunk. You, you're not intended to go get groceries in this car. This is the track car. So who cares about the front trunk? Let's just get these big, huge air scoops through here so we can get even more air up over the car, get that car glued down. And like I said, this is unlike any other Lamborghini where the whole entire front clip lifts up. And again, you just notice this is all carbon fiber. It's really, really light. And the whole thing just kind of flips up and I'm gonna have to walk around to the other side here because this is a little different than most cars. The, the prop rod here doesn't hold the hood open. It actually keeps the hood from going too far. So just a neat little extra thing here. And, and again, we're gonna see, this is just purely a track focused car. There's not much here. Um, the trunk space that you would normally have in a Lamborghini is all eaten up with these air ducts. Um, you do have, you know, some concession here. Like I said, they claim a helmet is going to fit in this front bay. It's, it's not small, but it's not huge. And I, I don't think any of my helmets would fit in this. Um, you do, interestingly enough, have 12 volt power here. Um, so you can power something that's stored in the trunk. I don't know what that would be because when you turn the car off, it shuts off power to this 12 volt system. So what you would do with this, I don't know. I guess you're gonna take it to the track. And I know this is gonna lead into the next question, which is, well, what about the Nürburgring lap times? And quite frankly, the Performante was already one of the fastest cars at the ring. And it was the fastest car for a while, at least as far as production cars go. We're talking about a six, sec six minute 52 second lap. The only cars that are faster today are going to be your 911 GT2 RS, your Lamborghini Aventador SVJ, and your Mercedes AMG GT Black Edition, which all, all of those are fractionally faster, but we're not talking just blisteringly faster than this car. And we don't actually know what the Nürburgring time is for this because Lamborghini has decided that they're no longer interested in what the ultimate lap time is. And we've talked about this amongst ourselves at Petrol Lounge. I don't know their reasoning, but here we're starting to see that people are making a shift where before it was all about, you know, this car was the fastest zero to 60 or look at the Nürburgring times. Today, everything that you can get into is so unbelievably fast that I would say 98% of the drivers out there could never even get enough performance out of this car to differentiate it from the Huracan Performante or even the Aventador SVJ. You're going to be looking at this car and basically turning the same lap times regardless of which car you're in. They're not that much different between each one and your ability to extract that kind of difference in performance has to be nearly world-class. So you know, Lamborghini has just decided it doesn't matter anymore. What really matters is how the car feels when you drive it. And I'll kind of talk about that a little bit later, but like I said, this is your finely crafted track instrument. This is what you use when you go to the track and it's just going to feel more alive, more light in your hands and more willing to do the kind of track work that you would want to do if you were to buy this particular automobile. And as a side note, it's a good thing that Lamborghini isn't interested in Nürburgring lap times because now this car is actually too loud for the Nürburgring. So even if they go out there, um, they're going to have to do something. They're going to put a new exhaust on it or, I don't know, not drive it as hard because they're going to get run off from the track for exceeding the decibel limits. 
As we walk back this way, the aggressiveness kind of continues with, you've got this big thing up here on top of the car, which a lot of people think is an air intake for the engine. It doesn't actually direct into the air intakes. Your air intakes for the engine are down through here, actually, just like it is on every other uh, Huracan. However, this does help with cooling of the engine and the components in here. It just brings a lot more air down into the engine bay and back out behind the car. There's also this crazy fin here. A lot of people have talked about it. It's a little bit subtle until you're actually up on the car and then you just notice there's this big groove down through here and this big wing that comes up. I'm sure it has a purpose for directing air into this knock -a duct or something, um, but I haven't seen anyone talking about what it does, not even the Lamborghini engineers. So it's a little bit of a mystery to me. I also don't know where this duct goes to. It is new on this car. So it does some additional cooling for the car. And then there's this crazy wing back here and it is an adjustable wing. You do have a bolt here and over here. You can loosen these and you can increase the rake of the wing. You can get more downforce out of it or you can set it down and go for top speed. You just can't change it on the fly. And this wing, I believe, is one of the highest downforce wings that Lamborghini has produced. This is a thousand pounds at speed. So you're gonna get a lot of downforce out of this whole attachment here. And then as you walk to the back, it's just more aggressive stuff back here. Um, you've got your rear diffusers and it's just a really aggressive look. A lot more carbon fiber, you know, just over the top. Uh, really dramatic, really pretty to look at, and it just kind of screams, you know, look at me. You know, you could see the exhaust through some of these holes. You could see the rear wheels, the rear tires. It's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's an amazing look on this car. Now, these wheels and the brakes are specific to the STO, and, and this is a unique pattern. And I really like what Lamborghini has been doing with their wheels. You see a little bit of this on the Evo as well. It's just even more open than this. And what they're going for is almost like a, a, a fragile wheel design where the spokes are impossibly thin and you have these huge gaping holes. And it's not as dramatic on this car as it is the Evo. The Evo has much bigger holes, uh, but what you're looking at here when you're up close on it you realize yeah it's it is super thin there's just not a lot here as far as structural i i don't know you know they don't feel like they are uh carbon fiber wheels so i don't know how they're getting the uh the tensile strength out of it but it, it is an amazing look it's really dramatic and when the car is going down the road this tends to just kind of fade away and almost look like there's no wheel here at all and the, the brakes here, these are uh, a new compound. They're CCMR, so it's a carbon ceramic uh, compound. But this is, the R is a race version that Brembo has come out with. Um, not only is it a little more aggressive for track use, again, this is the track car, but also this brake material holds up a lot better under the extreme conditions that you'll experience at the track. And that is important because what we are finding is a lot of people that buy the carbon ceramic brakes and then go and take their cars to the track, they tend to start replacing those with steel brake rotors. They go back to the old style instead of keeping the carbon ceramics. And, and you might ask why you would do that. And really the reason is these rotors are extremely expensive, extremely fragile. So are the pads. You're talking about a brake job on a car like this could cost you twenty or thirty thousand dollars. Really, I mean, for for anybody, even if you can afford this car, it's still a heart stopping moment when they tell you, "Hey, you know, your brake job is going to cost the, as much as a normal car." So what happens is at the track, they're they're really great. They they will give you better stopping better lap times, but it is a fraction better. And on the track, you just chew through these compounds. I have seen cars like this go through a set of brakes, brake rotors and pads in a day out at Coda. Now, Coda is a really hard use track. Um, it's got, Circuit of America has a lot of heavy braking zones uh, and you're doing that over and over again, building a lot of heat, you're braking from high speeds. So you do chew up a little faster than you would somewhere like say VIR or Lime Rock. But even still, you know, if I told you, hey, every three or four track days, you're gonna spend 30 grand on brakes. 
you might reconsider that. So what they're trying to do here is they say, oh, this is a track focused car. Let's increase the durability of the pads under those conditions. Now that means they will not be quite as tractable on the street. They probably will make a little bit of noise at times, um, all kind of qualities that most people don't want in their street cars. But when you're on the track, you care about that less and you're more interested in let's get that longevity out of it. Let's make sure that my $30,000 goes just a little bit further. As we go to get into this car, I'm taken with this matte paint, which is a really popular trend these days. Everybody gets really excited over matte paints. And it's something we see a lot here at Petrol Lounge. And I, I wanted to pause for a minute to talk about it because a lot of people don't think about matte paint when they spec it on their car. And they think this is gonna be the easiest paint in the world to live with. I don't have to worry about polishing it. I don't have to worry about whatever. It's already dull, who cares? Nothing could be further from the truth. Matte paint is one of the most difficult paints to deal with on a car. And it's kind of unusual that you would spec it on a track car because of that reason. And this one has been PPF'd. There is a complete wrap job on top of this with uh, stealth film, which we always recommend for anyone that is going to buy a matte car and drive it at all, whether you drive it on the street or you drive it on the track. And part of that is really and truly you have, this paint is so delicate. You have to be so careful with it. For example, let's just say I take this car out to the track and I pick up a bunch of clag, a bunch of rubber from other tires and it gets all over the car. On a normal, you know, a normal gloss car like this uh, Lotus over here, I could just take it to my detailer and say, you know, be, be aggressive with it. You know, get your, your compounds out and really work that stuff off the paint. But on this car, if you get aggressive with the paint trying to clean something off and rub on it real hard here, you're going to create a shiny spot. You're actually going to polish it just a little bit and it will be glaringly apparent. You, you'll come up to it from 10 feet and you'll be like, why is there this area where the paint doesn't look quite right? And then you also have to worry about, let's say a, a minor scratch. I take this to go get groceries, which you know I don't know that anyone that owns this would ever do, but you might. And you park it at the far end of the parking lot and somebody decides they have to pose on the car, which this is a hazard with a Lamborghini. And the rivet on their jeans just happens to put a scratch here on the car. Again, if we're talking about this Lotus, I could bring that to my detailer and he could polish that right out of the paint. Not really a big deal. It looks dramatic, it looks scary, but no big deal. And if he really can't polish it out all the way, we can go back with touch-up paint. We can get it looking at least 98% correct. If you scratch this, there's no going back. They're, the only thing you can do is repaint. You can't polish on it because again, it's matte paint. You polish on it, you're just going to create a polish spot. You can't put, you can't color match it or anything else. You can't put touch up paint in it. It will stand out like a sore thumb. You just have to live with that scratch or just repaint the whole door. And a lot of times, and I have seen this on these matte cars, you think, hey, I could just repaint this door in matte. It'd be really easy to match. What you don't realize is the, the matte finish is actually kind of a pebbled surface. And if you don't get that pebbling exactly the same, it stands out even more than a, a mismatched paint job on a normal car. And then we get into, okay, you know what? I can live with all that. I can deal with all that. I'm just gonna be really careful with the car. I'm not gonna drive it much. I'll be super careful when I wash it. Okay, well, this isn't gonna happen the first time you wash it or even the 10th time, but maybe the hundredth time you come down through here and you're washing on your car, you can't help but put just a little more pressure on these ridges, all these little sharp lines. It, it's, it's a known thing. All of your detailers will tell you about it when they're polishing cars. You know, they have to be careful of these ridges. You, you just end up putting a little bit more pressure, not much, but that little bit of pressure over 100 washes or 200 washes will slowly polish all of these lines. And suddenly, I mean, maybe you like the effect or maybe you like the patina, but you will get just little polish marks everywhere just as a result of just even washing the car. Like I said, if you're gonna get matte paint, please go and get it paint protected because it's not a paint you can actually live with. It is dramatic, but really just a, a painful paint to actually experience in real life. So, you know, 
Now that we're done talking about the paint, let's just go ahead and open the door and let's go inside the car and have a look. As we sit down in the STO, we're really taken with just how track focused this car is. It really has a lot more in common with say the Ferrari 458 Speciale or the Porsche GT3 RS. You get in, there's no carpet on this floor. It is carbon fiber and uh, you know just a bare floor pan. The, the doors are exceptionally light. We talked about how light this car is even compared to you know the other Huracans that are out there. And it's just a, a full carbon fiber door panel here. Um, and there's not a whole lot to the door. And the seats here, they're, they're not power seats, they're full manual. They are really nice though. The, the way that they hold you, these are really comfortable. I can tell you just going around a track, this is going to be the kind of seat that you really want. It's gonna hold you really well. There aren't five point harnesses in here, but you could easily install them. You do have a nifty center latch down here between your legs to move the seat forward and back. And it looks strange when you first see it, but I have to tell you, having used it, it's amazing. It's really intuitive and you can quickly adjust the seat. You're not in a weird position trying to grab the lower handle down there. It's just great. Uh, like all of the Lamborghini Huracans, you have the flip up switch here with the start stop button that turns on your car, lights everything up. Uh, the controls in these cars I always find kind of interesting. They, they have these neat little switches here. I'll let that finish off. They, they have a nice look and feel, but they are kind of weird in that, like this is your window for the driver's side. This is the one for the passenger side. And they don't work the way that you would expect. Like you think to, uh, to roll the window up, you would kind of push up on this button and it doesn't seem to do anything. You actually pull back and kind of down and that brings the window up. Bring the window down, you go the other way. It, every single time I get in one of these cars, I get it wrong. And I've been in these cars a lot. It's never intuitive. I don't know why they designed it that way. I think it's really neat though. Another thing interesting on this car is uh, the turn signals. I don't know anyone that has sat down in a Huracan and drove it for the first time and found the turn signals. And I mean, literally found the turn signals. Everyone drives it, they come back and they're like, I, I don't know where they are. And they're actually right here on the steering wheel. They're this little bitty switch and you can access it really easily while you're driving without ever taking your hand off the wheel. And it's just a, a push to the right to activate the right turn signal and a push to the left. And if you wanna cancel, it's straight down on that switch. It's nice, it's, it's a great design, but it is so different and just non-obvious that no one ever seems to know what they're doing with it. Looking at the steering wheel, we've also got a new selector down here. Um, there are three new track modes on this car. The first one is STO, which oddly I would think would be the uh, track performance mode, but no, that is just your regular street mode. When you click down into Trofeo mode, that is actually the race mode on this car. And then you have what they call, uh, uh, P I can't even pronounce it, Piogia, which is the wet traction mode. That is your wet performance if you're driving this car and uh, you're in a low traction environment, that's the one you're gonna want. Um, everything else is you know pretty standard. It's very Lamborghini. Um, you have all of your controls here for your, uh, your transmission, you select reverse by pulling up on this. You got your park. Um, this selects actually the manual shift. And this has a uh, seven speed dual clutch transmission. And like we're seeing in every performance car these days, you've got your paddle shifters back here to, to shift. And, and they're nice and big. And I, I really like Lamborghini's philosophy, uh, which follows a lot of other manufacturers as well, like Ferrari, which is your downshift is always on the left, your upshift is always on the right, and it doesn't follow the steering wheel. It stays exactly where it is. So some manufacturers like McLaren, the, the paddles will actually follow the wheel, and I find it equally intuitive. I don't find one to be better than the other, but for some people, they do find that, you know, if they've got the wheel really counted over, they, uh, they can't remember you know, which one is up and which one is down. So that kind of 
poses a problem. Whereas here, no matter where you have the steering wheel, even if you're all crossed up and everything else, if you need to downshift, it's over on this side. If you need to upshift, it's over here. And, and you'll also notice that these paddles are a lot bigger than, uh, than most just because you have to have them for you know when you're counted over in a in a turn when you got you know the steering wheel way over you still want to be able to grab it with either your pinky or your index finger and hit that that paddle shift so um, they tend to just be a little bit bigger so the question comes back to is this the best lamborghini that lamborghini has ever built and i have to say it depends I mean, when you're talking about Lamborghinis, you're really talking about a lot of really storied automobiles. You're talking about things like the Mura and the Countach that, in my mind, those are exquisite, really incredible cars. The, the Countach, you know, it, it's just absolutely timeless. You look at that car today and it still looks fresh. And if you ask somebody to say, you know, what does a supercar look like? That's kind of it. That's what people see in their mind is the Lamborghini Countach. It is the epitome of supercar. And when I think about the Mura, I think, man, I don't know if there's a prettier car out there. And I know GM bought one just so they could do a design study and pull elements from it to put into the C3 Corvette, which I also think is one of the prettiest Corvettes out there. The interior is nearly identical to the Mura. It's very obviously inspired. And, you know, I, I look at those cars, I'm like, is this as iconic as those cars? I don't know. And, and that's, it's really hard to say today whether this car will ever be that kind of icon. It's, it's hard to say, you know, is this album a classic album? Was this a classic movie? Um, you know, I'm old enough now that I've, I've seen, you know, movies that when I watched them, I didn't know they were gonna be classics. I didn't know uh, Pretty Hate Machine was gonna be a future classic album, but here we are today and I'm like, well, yeah, obviously they are. Why didn't I know it at the time? Maybe this is going to be one of those cars. It is really an incredible car. And, and when I start looking at things like the Mura and the Countach, they are, they're wonderful cars, they're dramatic, but I will also tell you those cars are kind of a mess and the owners of them will tell you they're kind of a mess. They're difficult to live with and they are Italian exotics in the best and worst ways. They're not reliable, they're not easy to drive. They're, they are fast, but they're not fast in the way that you would really think of a car being enjoyable fast. And on top of that, they're not really that fast compared to modern cars today. So, you know, they're very much a product of their time. And if you own one, it's not something you're going to take out of the garage every day. And I, I know this is the track focused car. And we talked about that. Hey, you know, this is a car I'm going to take to the track. I'm not going to get groceries in it. Okay, sure. But you could, you could daily drive this car. It would be a little bit difficult. You'd have, you know, some complaints about just the noise and the vibration and the harshness and just the general focus of the car but it wouldn't be the kind of thing that at the end of a month you'd be like, well, I'm never doing that again. I can tell you if you tried to daily drive a Countach, you would definitely have that reaction. And if you didn't, your pocketbook definitely would. So in that regard, yeah, I think it's better. And, you know, I start looking at, you know, things like the SVJ and I already talked about that. You know, if you want a car to be dramatic, if you want a car to show up and everybody's gonna come and talk to you and ask questions and look at your car and point at it and take photos, yeah, you're, you know what, go, go buy the Aventador, that's your car. Um, if you want a car that you can put on the track, if you want a car that's gonna be rewarding to drive, if your focus is the driving experience, which that's what I come back to, that's what it boils down to for me is, how does this car drive? What is this car really like? This is the car I want. And quite frankly, right now, if you said, hey, you can have any Lamborghini that's out there and the, the caveat is you have to drive it every day. It's gonna be your only car. It has to kind of do everything. Yeah, this, this is the one I'm gonna want. This is the one I'm gonna pick. So answering that question, I'm gonna tell you, yes, this is the best Lamborghini that Lamborghini has built yet. It is amazing. It's incredible. I don't have enough superlatives to explain this car. It is just all out wonderful. Thanks for watching everybody. We've been presenting today the Lamborghini STO. Uh, keep watching because we got a lot more great content coming your way. I'm sure in the background you've been seeing cars and you've been looking and you're like, well, what about that? And 
I can't promise you that all this stuff is eventually gonna land on the channel because I know some of it will not. Uh, I have to thank our owners that do allow us to share these cars. Um, you know, the owner of this car was very kind, very nice to let me go through this car and share it with you today. And we'll be getting more of these cars as we go. So click like and subscribe, keep watching. There's a lot more content coming your way. Thanks everybody.